Well, thank you so much, everyone. My name is Josh Sherman. I am the Learning and Development Manager here at GitLab. I'm super excited to be joined with the eGroup to host our first ever handbook interactive discussion. And today we're going to be diving deep into the Making Decisions page, which is a sub page off of the leadership page. And we're really going to hear from leadership about how you know, you can take points on that handbook page and apply it into your day-to-day -day role. Um, and this video is intended to be super free flowing um, and leadership, feel free to chime in if there's any big points you'd like to discuss. So making decisions at GitLab, it's a lot different than a lot of other organizations that I've been a part of and I'm sure everybody else has. And, you know, looking at the making decisions leadership page, you know, what rings true to how we currently operate? Yeah, to answer your question, uh, Josh, I think we're doing a really good job of taking decisions transparently. I think a lot of decisions are open for everyone to comment on. I think we're doing a less good job on iteration. For example, people call sometimes say, oh, it's an iteration while well, they're just revising have another revision of a draft. Um, and I think the thing that gets called out here, like the very counterintuitive thing about our process is that we're going to invite everyone to contribute, but that means that you don't always get acknowledgement or feedback on your comments. And that is counterintuitive. And I think people still struggle with that. I struggle with that if I don't, if, if someone doesn't acknowledge my, my comment or my opinion. Uh, and, and mine probably get a lot more attention than others. So I think that that we call that out as a as something that's hard, and it is really hard to do. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do because if you require people to give acknowledge everyone, you're going to see decisions fly under the radar. But it doesn't mean it's easy. I think one. Uh... One thing that I've noticed is the values hierarchy is really important. And when we have a discussion about tension between those, we tend to get a healthy uh, result in the decision. So, if, you know, results versus efficiency, collaboration versus efficiency, um, those uh, debates are usually pretty healthy and making sure we get the best decision. I do think that there are times that we don't have that debate. <laughs> And that leads to a problem um, where uh, you know different people involved in the process will be thinking about the the elements of the hierarchy with different weights in their own mind, but didn't come together and actually discuss it and come to a, an agreement. So I think continuing to drive that and use the values as a framework is important to make sure we actually get the right um, the right inputs and quickly uh, make the right decision. Uh, another thing that rings true for me is that the notion of the DRI is is commonly understood and almost all the time followed and usually the DRI is pretty clear and I think uh, people who think of themselves as the DRI on a specific project or action tend to exhibit the right behaviors. Um, so that's awesome. You know, for example, the product development flow outlines who owns what throughout. And I think we've done a pretty good job of, of making it clear who the DRI is given what the, where you are in the flow. Um, where it gets harder is when the DRI isn't immediately clear. Uh, for example, a large cross-functional project where you know, maybe multiple levels and multiple functions are involved. Uh, when, when uh, people at a higher level need to be consulted before moving forward. I think the DRI in those types of situations gets a little murkier. So uh, we may want to clarify how to handle situations like that where uh, maybe multiple levels or multiple functions are involved. Josh, yeah, when you talk about a balance between consensus and hierarchy, I, I, I cringe a bit because it's, um, it feels like it's a trade-off. And if you, if you see it as a signal, like one side is completely hierarchical, one side is completely consensus, what we don't want is to be in the middle where we find a balance between the two. We wanna be like a digital signal where in the information gathering phase, we're completely consensus 
and in the decision making phase, we're completely hierarchical. We want to, we're splitting those two things so that we don't have to find a balance because you can never get that balance right. And lots of companies have tried and it, it doesn't, you get the worst of both worlds if you try to find a balance. We're trying to split it and say, hey, in the information gathering phase, it is consensus as in everyone gets to see it and everyone gets to provide input. In the decision-making phase, it is that single person deciding and getting the best of two worlds. Yeah, thanks, Sid. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, just as we, just on that point specifically, as we grow and scale as an organization, what are some ways we can maintain that? Just some tactical steps that team members can apply to ensuring that happens. I think there's a big role for leadership. I think I don't always do a good job of deferring to the DRI. I try to be conscious of that, but I think we should call it out like, hey, see, I don't think you're the DRI on this. And still it feels like you're taking the decision here. I, I don't frequently like have something happen that I totally disagree with. And, and I, could, I could challenge myself more of deferring to the DRI. Great point. And to that point, Josh, I think the, the company, this is an observation being a relatively new to the company is um, a lot of companies have values, but it don't really incorporate them into their day-to-day -day decision making and framework. And here, I think everyone does a great job of having those, those values first to drive the decision and to think about the decisions around those values. And so um, team members have been great about bringing up, you know, what the values are, referring back to the values, and it, it's it's in the day to day sort of every meeting. You know, everybody's so familiar with them. I think that's critically important. I think of it as like there, there's this tension between like we talked about extreme ownership yesterday, and like executives have to own everything, and I think that's still true. But that makes us like the responsible individual, not the directly responsible individual. The DRI is usually someone deeper, more in the org, more local to the problem. And someone that's meant to kind of like centralize everything that needs to be um, learned about the problem, all the potential solutions, keep everybody else informed that needs to. And ideally they're empowered to actually make the decision or make the recommendation and put that forward at the right time if they need a CEO or an executive to actually um, you know, approve it. They've sort of done all the work. They've they've set the table. And I think McBride highlighted um, David Santos' ability to do this yesterday, which I thought was very very apt. Where he'll just kind of create this gravity around something, and you know, people above and below him in the org chart are kind of working for him in that context. And that's um, uh, that's the uh, ideal way it should work. I think one thing that um, I would add is there's confusion sometimes about isolation of individual decisions. And really what we're trying to do is get a successful outcome. And that's an, on an ongoing basis. And the DRI is not just responsible for any one individual decision, but the collection of those decisions. So if they're responsible for a product, for a result, for a particular uh, outcome, um, they're responsible for the collective inputs and outputs that result, uh, that sorry, that uh, accumulate to that result for the business. And uh, that means there's going to be trade-offs. Uh, that means some of the decisions might have to uh, go one way in order to balance out some others to get that best possible result for, for GitLab and, and our customers. Um, so I think an important part of DRI is that it's not just for a particular project or a particular decision. It's ownership of that result uh, that comes from that collection of decisions. No, that's great insight. Thank you so much, uh, Michael and Eric. Is there anything that like causes you pause? Is there something that doesn't feel right or isn't happening? And is, is there something we should be doing differently? Um, you know, right now at GitLab when it comes to making decisions, just from, from your all's perspective? I think we should acknowledge when the person doing the work doesn't have final decision-making approval. 
I think that is fairly rare, but occasionally it exists. And just acknowledging that, like, I, I own this work, I'm going to make the recommendation, but this person owns the decision is a healthy clarification to make. I think that sometimes at GitLab, um, uh, and since we're specific on things that make me, <laughs> when, I, when I feel uncomfortable, um, often it's because there is a very narrow field of view and the team gets very focused on accomplishing a task. So a decision gets really narrow into how do, how do I minimize this to the point that I can check the box? Whereas what we were really looking for was the minimum iteration. And the minimum iteration was to progress towards that result that we want. And uh, we can sometimes get too narrow if we really just try to make it a task on paper, as opposed to the, the sort of the minimum viable change for a, for a positive business outcome. We still need that positive business outcome. And, uh, and I've seen processes uh, suffer sometimes when they get so narrow um, that we weren't going to get the result we wanted in the first place. And you have to kind of rescope and, and, and zoom back out. And by losing that picture, we lost time. Uh, because we had to, you know, as Sid mentioned earlier, instead of shipping and iterating, we had to revise and there were lots of revisions in a particular process. Yeah, I think it's like claim the space. And I think um, sometimes decisions get deferred to the e-group. I think it's really important to sometimes say, oh, um, either this is my proposal and just wait for the yes. Um, but many times it could just be, I made this decision. Like it's good to keep people in the loop, but that doesn't mean you have to wait for a decision. And most things, if it's really disastrous one, it can be reversed. And if it's not disastrous, we can see how it works out and we'll, we'll, we'll have a chance to do something else in the future. And most of the time, obviously it's right because they're closer to the subject matter than uh, the, the leader of often. I wonder yeah. if, oh, sorry. No, you. I'll flip you. Um, I wonder if it's possible to introduce into the onboarding um, different sort of rubrics for making decisions for folks that might be new to this concept who haven't had the ability or empowerment prior jobs to make decisions in their role so that we can kind of give them a couple different frameworks to choose from. They can eventually develop their own style, but that they don't feel like the first time this, they, the first time they have to go through this, that they're kind of out in the cold. Um, I mean, I'm speaking personally from legal most of the times legal folks don't necessarily make, they make a ton of decisions in legal documents. They don't necessarily make a ton of decisions in other roles or coming out of law firms. Usually it's, it's deferred to the client and I'd like to figure out a way to teach folks how to do that. I think that's a great point. I think that's something I've heard across the organization, just the concept of, of being a manager of one. Like that's a very new concept for a lot of people, especially if you come from a very top-down organization. So. I think a, a lot, some team members do struggle with how do I actually be a manager of one and apply that into my role. So I would love to include some onboarding work to improve that new team member experience. So. And yeah, and I think like take the fear out of it too about like that it's, you know, about making the decisions because I think a lot of folks kind of can get tripped up in the potential repercussions of making a bad decision and there's different grades of bad decisions. Which actually is a good segue. I was wondering, Sid, if if you thought we could use one-way and two-way doors as sort of a way to say, basically make as many two-way door decisions as you want as being manager of one. If it's a one-way door decision, you might want to ask somebody. <laughs> you might want to get some feedback from your boss or something like that to give people some guardrails. Yep. Um, I think that's a super helpful framework and it's much better than say, oh, is it an important decision or not? Because that's not, that's not helpful at all. Uh, the reversibility and the, the ability to adjust later is, is much more important. And if you take a bad decision, but it's, it's small and in two weeks we can do something different, that's a very different uh, thing than something where we're locked in for the next two years. Yeah, what McBee said. I, I noticed that my, my item kept moving down in the agenda here. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see it. It was below my page. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so I don't need to repeat what Todd said there, but um, in point uh, L there, I, the whole framework is key. If you're the DRI for a decision, it's key to know that you have to define it, clarify as, as Todd mentioned, it's a one-way or two-day door, 
a two-way door um, and use that to frame to the whole team that what that means for the path of decision. And so we can move quickly. It's a two-way door. Um, here's the amount of time we're going to put into the decision process, and then we're going to make a decision. Um, that helps everyone to, to move quickly and sort of frame their input. Um, but the last part that I think is key is that um, the DRI, go ahead and do the prep work. And when others are coming in, there's already you know, a set of options considered and a recommendation. Um, I find that that shaves a lot of time off of decisions at GitLab when the DRI has already confidently articulated the recommendation and the other options considered. We still get a good debate, uh, but it tends to go much, much faster. Yeah, I, I can, I, well, I totally agree. Um, having an argument for like, what options did you consider? Because frequently when I see a decision, I'm like, oh, but I really think they should do X or Y. And I come in and I see they consider that option that like 80 to 90% of the time, great, they considered it. They probably have a better grasp from that. I'd be worried if they haven't considered that alternative, then, I, then I'd, I'd stop. Should always be a recommendation. Like anytime you 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 ask something of your manager, always have an option for them to just say yes. Like if I can't answer your question with a three-letter word, you're not doing it right. Um, and then also, and that's something we're not we're we're not doing. Why is this the smallest and fastest thing we could do? Uh, and that's that's something I don't frequently see, but I, I'd love to see more of. So smallest and fastest options considered and the recommendation. The way, the way I kind of think of it, something that's important is there have to be stakes. Like we're all, we're all flying without safety nets. And in, at the extreme example, like Sid might make a decision and the company goes to, to zero. And that's kind of what we're training people to do. But there has to be a safety net, but there can't be zero stakes. Like we need to keep the stakes low. People just feel like they can take risks, they can fail. That's going to be okay. Their jobs aren't at uh, risk. But um, between the decision and the safety, you know, there needs to be substantial distance. Like I don't know if ever, anybody's like ever jumped into a quarry or jumped off a bridge or something like that, but at a certain height, you have that instinct to kind of like windmill, like, oh, I haven't hit bottom yet. And you know, it's gotta be that type of decision where they know they're safe, but they've had that moment that like they're, they're, they're out on their own um, and that the, the stakes are, are real. Um, so in addition to the two-way door thing, I think there has to be a sort of like magnitude or, or seriousness to, to what they're doing. That made me think we need to define mistakes. Is it defined somewhere? And I just haven't read that. I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's specifically called out, but maybe that's something we could, we could definitely look at. I'll give you the scenario why I say that is that I've had meetings with people on the team who said, well, I'm uh, afraid to speak up because I made a mistake. Um, and my, my boss, you know, didn't handle that well or something, right? Or I feel like, first of all, it's a bad thing to have happen. Um, and we need to address that from the perspective of inclusion and all those kind of things. But um, sometimes people think a mistake is uh, I missed some information and then I made a bad decision or I was, you know, I didn't meet my expectations of my manager. Um, those aren't the same as I made a I made a call and the call was wrong. That's a mistake. Um, we don't want to. I think people are uh, confusing performance with mistakes, and I want to. I think we should get really clear about that. It would help in a lot of. Um, conversation like uh, performance discussions that um, that I have. <clears throat> yeah, I want to second that. I think it's really important, Todd, and it's something I've I've not clearly articulated. So, um, the people making the most mistakes are likely to be the people making the most decisions are likely to be our highest performers. Um, and if you're not making mistakes, you're probably making decisions too late. You collect too much data and you make too few decisions and to probably make them too late. And we have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty 
that means a certain percentage is wrong. Important thing is find when it's wrong, acknowledge it, try to fix whatever you can and communicate it and, and, and move on. And uh, high performance is not making zero mistakes. In, in fact, like if you're making zero mistakes, I can guarantee you you're not highly performing. It's kind of like the, the surgeon example where, you know, as surgeons improve in their career, their mortality rates go down. And then at the very tail end, it skyrockets because those are the people taking on the absolute hardest cases. Exactly. 